artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world. Well, let's um let's get right into it. Um thanks so much for joining our first visiting artist talk. Thanks, Amber, for setting it up and being awesome from your home in Arkansas. I'm gonna read the bio and then I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Billy to follow. Um, for those that don't know too, um, Teresa who worked with me at the school, as you all, some of you may know, um, works with Billy at Rare. So that's cool. And her, her son, my son, well, let's come over and say hi real quick. Yeah. Hey, all right, go back to play with me again. So anyways, here's, a, here's an intro to um, Billy and Rare, for that matter. Billy DeFall is a Philly-based artist, musician, engaged in a wide variety of creative disciplines. He's a co-founder creative director of Rare, uh, an artist residency located at Revolution Recovery, a construction and demolition waste recycling facility in Northeast Philadelphia. Rare's mission is to challenge the perception of waste culture by providing a unique platform for artists at the intersection of art and industry. It's literally in the intersection, which you will see. Um, Billy is also known for his ongoing collaborative work with his brother, Stephen. They are called the DeFala brothers. The brothers create drawing prints, sculpture, performance, music, and design. They're represented by Fleischer Holman Gallery in Philadelphia and co-teach in the sculpture department at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Billy also used to be in a very renowned Philadelphia underground band. Um, so he's a man of many talents. And he's wearing an orange hard hat and he's just getting over COVID. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Billy DeFala. Thank you, Nato. And hey, for everybody, Teresa says what's up. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, hey, Nato, really quick time check. Uh, how, how long do I got? Like half an hour? Yeah, do about a half hour and then we'll get some questions for everybody. We'll just dive in. Sound cool? Sounds good. So I'll try and like zip through. Normally I take about an hour to do this, but I'll give you a little bit of background on myself, kind of entry point OG origin story. So as Nato mentioned, I'm an artist, I'm a sculptor, work with my brother. And from the time I was in school, I'm, I'm a materials guy. And in the small community, Philadelphia art scene isn't too huge. I became known as the materials guy. I broke into a lot of buildings. I jumped into dumpsters, became friends with sand people and salvage folks and people who worked at scrapyards. Economically motivated at first, but very quickly becoming part of the concept and content of the work that uh, me and my brother were working on collaboratively. And uh, I was the guy that if somebody didn't know how to get a hold of something or at Home Depot or the hardware store, they would come to me. And I was, I was, I was searching on an inquiry about architectural glass. And at the time in 2009, there was a high rise going up in downtown Philadelphia. It's the Comcast building. And I uh, sourced a, uh, a, 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 what we call a transfer station that was receiving all of this mismeasured architectural glass from the construction site. And I followed that lead and I came to Revolution Recovery, which is the construction and demolition waste recycling facility that I'll be walking around in in a second. I met the owners, they're young entrepreneur, outside the box thinking, creative business guys. We hit it off. I started that relationship and I stayed informally in touch with them, just kind of coming up to the yard and understanding what their, their uh, business was about and informally sourcing materials from them. There was, a, there was a soft spot for the creative process. They had friends that were furniture designers and artists, so like they were happy to let me in. Um, at the time, they were lecturing about their business model at sustainable design programs in the region, and I met my co-founder through the owners who introduced us. My co-founder, Fern Gukin, was doing her master's on starting an artist resource inside of Revolution Recovery. They put us together, and from that point on, we started working on her thesis as an idea, I would, be, I would be helping her with her thesis as long as we continue to uh, develop the program, which became rare, and make it a thriving uh, nonprofit that would continue to work with Revolution Recovery. So kind of giving you that, that little bit of a backstory, it took, it took about five to six years. As, as Nato mentioned, I used to be in a band. I made a living playing rock and roll. So in the first couple of years, I didn't have to have a job when I was in Philadelphia and I was hanging out at the recycling center. So it took me 
it, it, it offered me a certain amount of it just takes time to do these things. It, it does not, you can't force it. It's all about relationship building, listening to people. It took me years to become friends with all of the operations and dispatch. And there's a certain amount of uh, maintenance to the relationships that make an opportunity like what we have here possible. So it really is um, a lot of day-to-day -day being, we, we consider this an art and industry collaboration. It's an immersive experience that we provide for artists annually. But it's really, it's an art project around the opportunity that we have, you know, built our reputation at this point internationally as, as an artist residency. So it's, it started out, we didn't, we didn't offer artists anything. It was just a studio space and access to the materials. Um, when I get out here, I'm going to, I'm going to jump onto the, to the actual walk in a second here, but just to kind of give you an idea on what C and D waste is, it's construction and demolition it has nothing to do with municipal curbside domestic uh, recycling or material. This is all coming from big industry and manufacturing. And think about any, any urban environment that's being uh, experiencing redevelopment and you have a lot of gentrifying neighborhoods. All of that new construction has demolition making clearing the way for that, uh, for that development. So all of that waste has got to go somewhere. You can't just always be burying that into landfill. There's a lot of complicated uh, regulations on how you dispose of those materials and municipal programs just simply don't deal with the glut, the larger proportion of what that is in the waste stream. So basically they bring in about 500 tons on average, and you can't really wrap your head around that number, but this is one facility within, within the city of Philadelphia and they have three other locations where they're bringing in about 500 tons of material daily. They divert 50% of that from landfill, and then they are taking that material, aggregating it, and, uh, and then selling it on the commodities market or figuring out innovative ways of keeping it outside of the landfill. So for us as a nonprofit, creating this artist residency is really about also creatively visualizing this of for other of otherwise known of the invisible waste stream that is not widely known by a citizen or the public in general. It's one of those things that people see dumpsters, they see construction sites, and they don't really understand the magnitude. It's one of the larger problems of in con, con, considering things in, in around uh, climate justice and environmental issues. This type of material makes up a very large amount of what we're putting into the earth. And if you follow it all the way back to the extractive practices that make these materials possible in the first place, all the way to its disposal and this uh, dispossession, all of that aspect of it, it's an incredibly large carbon footprint. It's one of those things that if we don't understand more about it, culturally speaking, it will continue to be dealt with in a way that is just, you know, it's riding us right up on uh, right, right up right up to the end of the, uh, to the, to the side of the cliff. Um, I'm going to just get on. Sorry, I'm going to get on the selfie stick. NATO, tell me you're going to be my uh, guy. Make sure that I don't cut out. See this uh, really sophisticated. No problem. I will be your guide. We are going to yeah. have an action cam. Here we go. Billy is exiting the building. Oh, He's exiting I'm going to run through the yard and kind of keep it like a little bit over here. What we got? That's the tip, that's the uh, that's the scale all day long. You can kind of see there's a there's a queue of trucks. They come in, they lay in on that scale, they go to the back of the yard, and they tip and they come back out. And that's how they know how much material they tipped on the tipping floor. And I'll explain the certain parts of the recycling facility as you walk through. Um, hey, Billy. Yeah. What I think you should do is show us and then talk a little closer to the mic when you can. Okay. You got a lot of competition. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, know. yeah. I usually have to, I should have told everybody to adjust their uh, their volume too because it gets a little loud. I have to scream. It's pretty it's a pretty noisy operation here. It's all right, it's all right. I'm loving it. It's totally awesome. <laughs> so okay. I mentioned the uh, 500 tons of material that comes in. There's a whole economy of materials here that you kind of have to understand. And usually what I do is I try to point out materials to illustrate this point. I love stopping here at dimensional lumber. If you think about wood. All of this, the recycling center will get paid to take this, but there is no market for it. So what they do is they chip it and they get rid of it for free. Hey, NATO, can you hear me still? Is that, is that all right? Hey, can you guys hear him? I can hear him. 
You just got to really get, you just got to turn your volume up. We're good. We got it, buddy. Keep going. All right. So I'm trying to illustrate the bottom line and how it works here. This material, they get paid to take it. They get rid of it for free. What they want to do is divert as much material from landfill as possible because they have to pay to get rid of it. Now, all the materials that come through a facility like this that they are recovering have a, a value on the commodities market. So right here, you have all of their steel. Steel is a, is a, is a C&D waste material. It's kind of the bread and butter. It's one of those things that they'll make a lot of money and it's always in the waste stream here. You have other materials like cardboard, rigid plastics, uh, rubble, concrete, <laughs> copper, brass, aluminum. Those types of materials they are always a constant in the waste stream. You can always pull them out aggregate them, but the market will go up and come down. It's kind of like the stock market and how you make your money doing that. And what Revolution Recovery does in order to always be generating revenue is they're always sending dumpsters out, collecting materials on job sites and then bringing them back. I really quick just want to show you because there's no real linear way through this. This is how it's sorted here. Yo, 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 what up? I haven't been here in a while, my apologies. So, what's up, Edward? So basically what they're doing, that 50% that they're the voting from landfill, they're sorting it by hand. And it's kind of crazy to imagine, but there's a conveyor belt up there and that 250 tons of material comes across that conveyor belt and all these, all these material bays fill up with the material, they'll grab them, they'll sort them and all the aluminum, they'll put them in a bale and then they pop out little briquettes like this. And they're not too little, they're about 1300 pounds. But that's basically what they make here. It's the dirtiest sort, removing any valuable materials from this waste stream before it goes and be, is uh, going into landfill. In a lot of situations, this material is still being put into landfill. So companies like this, they're, 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 it's not like they're new. It's not like recycling is anything like innovative. We've been doing it forever, but it's more about the blood and the, the, the soil at which these materials are made and development is booming and you know single use everything it becomes a big big problem if you're not managing yo yeah yeah so here we go right here this is the tipping for now i'm going to talk a little bit about the actual art program I'm trying to sprinkle in a lot about the, the recycling center and the industry itself because that is a so the tipping just so people know, the tipping floor is where the trucks come in and they dump their stuff out. So this is yeah. right, Billy. That's exactly right. And I'm gonna. Uh, and I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna be able to get nice and close on a dumpster actually dumping. Right here right, is where the this is where the sort starts for the company. But for the artist residency program, this is where the magic happens. This is where artists are never out here on their own during operating hours there's always staff to to assist them as you can kind of imagine already by the, the activity you see this is not necessarily the safest place to be so you kind of always have to have uh, staff out here during operating hours but this is where you pull materials a lot of artists are you know it, it takes a long time to acclimate to an environment like this but there's a ton of uh oh hey you got some Miller wafers you got some some domestic goods. I should say that part of that 500 tons on average is, um, it is home clean outs. If you think about somebody who has passed away and their entire, they have no next of kin, their entire life will be put into a dumpster and that, that person's entire contents of their home will end up on the tipping floor. A lot of artists are really interested in that. There's a lot of like fingerprints, let's talk personal history, being able to kind of read into, uh, race and gender and demographics and things like that just by looking at someone's garbage but for the most part what's here the most is your cnd and construction material but this right here looks like it may have been a home clean out so i'm just going to give you guys over to this so for the art program this is where we post up and this is where we actually get materials which is predominantly what the the residency program specializes in um and this is also where, for the company, this is where the beginning of the sort happens. So the tipping floor is really that threshold where all these materials cross over. But I'm just going to give you a second. Can you see this, NATO? Is that an all right image? God, you're busy. Oh, we can see it all right, buddy. This is, this couldn't be, this is by far the most action packed visiting artist talk of all time. Oh my God. 
Oh my god. Oh, it's like. So, and just kind of to try and give you a metric on this, it's probably about 200 of these that come through on a, on a regular basis, on a daily basis, sorry. Um, and you can kind of see the driver here is, um, he's scoping it out. He's like, hey, what do I got? Which is part of the culture, you know, like, I know most of the drivers here, they know me. Um, there's this no, no pooping rule, which is kind of amazing. It's one of the, one of the aspects that makes the, the operations team here are um, kind of exciting for artists and myself. I can't stress enough that like, this does not work without their buy-in. So if I don't have the relationship with these guys over here and the drivers and the, and the, uh, the equipment operators, then this program doesn't work. So, and and it's it's not like you kind of just, yeah, there's a precedent that, let's say a reputation that precedes me. So when new employees come in, they know who I am, but it's always in need of maintenance. There's a certain amount of care that's, uh, as, the, as, as the director of the program, I constantly have to mind and be uh, paying attention to. It's not like we just have this, agreement with the owners of the recycling center it's really it's a it's a, like a family like a, a family relationship so, uh, so really quick <laughs> this is the end of the line you saw that the tipping floor where all the material gets tipped they push it into a landfill pile and then they push it around the back of the building here it's going to be diverted from the landfill and right here we just got a guy who's pushing it up onto that ramp and then it gets loaded onto a conveyor belt that goes to that sort line that I showed you where they had the bays, the material bays, where they're sorting it all. So all of that is kind of their operation. With the residency program, it's not just about getting materials on the tipping floor. It's, it's really about, there's two programs that we offer. One's called a standard residency where you're pulling materials to give you a, a project space and, uh, and a shop to work out of that's at the front of the facility, which we will end in. You'll get to see it really quick. And then there's this thing we call the Biggie Shorty, which is more about a project that's working towards a document of the work being done. It's a more interventionist. It's more um, performed, photographed, staged. Um, it's not about building these things uh, as, like, as takeaways. It's about creating some sort of... Um, co-opting the the operation after hours or in on weekends when they're not in when they're not in full swing it's about working at night it's about how do you creatively interpret what's available here incorporate that into your practice it offers artists a lot more latitude than just a project that they're building to go put into a gallery or sell as an art option it's really not the most uh it's a it's a pretty challenging process a lot of artists apply to it and fail which is also an important thing to be able to create an environment in which we are able to learn from experimentation and things like that. But really it's, it's, um, it's about how you're creatively utilizing the resources we're making available through our program. So it's not just materials, make your art and then go and uh, show it somewhere. So there's a lot of latitude there, but I really quick just want to show you so you get a little bit more of um, the whole, the whole uh, picture of things. This barn right here in the property that I'm standing on is a, a remediated Superfund site. And for those of you who don't know what a Superfund site is, it's a parcel of land that's been uh, experienced environmental disaster caused by industry in some capacity. And through the Environmental Protection Agency and the local DAP, they have gone and uh, designated it an environmental hazard. And they raise a lot of money and they do the environmental cleanup and then what you get is a piece of property that has like, you know, tons and tons and tons of contaminant PCBs and other really uh, dangerous chemicals that have been, that were before it was a Superfund site that were leaching into a major waterway. Just beyond this field is the Delaware River. So this Superfund site before it was remediated was leaching chemicals, PCBs into a major waterway effectively jeopardizing uh, local populations with this, uh, with this pollutant. So. Now it has been capped, engineered, millions of dollars dumped into it to, uh, you know, keep it safe, um, keep it out of uh, harming any populations local nearby. And now this parcel of land 
was bought by Revolution Recovery and gifted to Rare to start understanding how we use this within the programming that we're doing moving forward. A little bit about the history of the organization. We've been doing the, uh, the residency program for about eight years. And this seems, uh, for us, we're looking at this as an opportunity to grow capacity and understand how we're engaging, more broadly speaking, with communities. Because as you just saw, as I walked you through the recycling center, it's kind of hard to bring groups of people from there. It's pretty dangerous. We do after, after hours on site engagements, uh, dystopian classic, like dystopian film screenings. NATO, you were there. No, wait, did you see one of the movies or were you just talking? I just talked with Tom Sachs. That's right, you didn't make it to the one in the movie. So uh, I, along with the residency program, we have this other area of program that we do, we call it special projects. We will take it upon ourselves, like over the course of the past eight years, is you're working very intimately with creatives and there's always like parts of conversations that go remain unanswered. We, re, we really built out our knowledge base uh, toolbox of understanding collectively and cumulatively over time what we do best is answer questions for artists if we don't already know the answers and that's one of the really in exciting aspects of being this art and industry collaboration is if i don't know the answer i have a hell of a lot of uh, resources to go and figure out what's actually happening or be put in touch with the specialists who can tell me a little bit more, more about it we do that through the residency program, but a lot of times there's conversations that don't ever culminate in any real representation of the artist project, but collectively over time remains an unanswered topic of conversation. So for instance, thinking about art, thinking about waste materials, uh, trash objects as artifacts, um, thinking about anthropology and archeology span at the intersection of industry and creative practices instead of finding an artist to do a project at the intersection of art and anthropology, we decided to bring actual anthropologists in here. And that's when we actually started understanding more about this burgeoning field in the social sciences called discard studies. So this is all to say there is this, uh, and now we have a bunch of scholars and scientists who are part of our extended family that are again, part of that larger knowledge base and community that we refer back out to and or do projects with. So this was all funded by a, a, a grant from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage. And this coincides with the actual art program. And it's never, uh, you know, it never takes real front seat to what we, what we are providing artists as an opportunity with, but rides uh, parallel with the programs that we're doing in order to support what the uh, conversation is with that particular artist or as something to refer back to some kind of specialist thing. So here, give me a, uh, so that's the uh, one of that, here we go, we're gonna get you into the, the studio. So all of this stuff that's happening, all this activity, like residency, special going? projects. So this is the, uh, this is the, this is the project space. You could you could take a breath, Billy. You could take yeah, a breath. Yeah, I think I'm out of breath just because I haven't really, I've been in a room for the past 18 days. I'm not used to like walking around and doing <laughs> short sprints here and there. Like the workout, all right. So um, this is the, the, so this is the project space. And if you're an artist in residence, this is where you actually post up. This is where you're doing your work. This becomes your home base. It's pretty overwhelming out there um, in the yard. It's, uh, it's, most people are not experienced with that type of environment. So not only physically demanding, but emotionally and psychologically, it can be a lot to take in when you think about the overall scope and magnitude and frequency in which that material is flown through and what those implications really mean in a larger scope of things. So this becomes the, the hang, you come in here, drink some water, relax, and like be able to kind of gestate about what it is that you're engaging with and develop ideas around and actually have the space to make the work. Um, mentioned a little bit about the special projects. The other thing that we're looking forward to as an organization is how we, uh, how we build capacity. I think I mentioned a little bit about that on the Superfund site. But we have a, an, an abundance of resources available that we've really never been able to tap historically through running just the artist and residency program. The thing that we're excited about looking forward um, is how we start utilizing these informal spaces 
outside of this very formal artist residency structure that we've had for the past eight years. And I mean that in terms of dimensional lumber. It's by volume, it's the largest material that's coming through this, uh, this facility. And it's really expensive after all the supply chain disruption and things out of post pandemic. So it's like that as a material is super duper uh, versatile when it comes to how we subsidize or collaborate with community partners. And one of the things that we're doing is not only just taking it in terms of who we can, who, what kind of network and uh, partner base we can develop with, by utilizing these materials and more informal programs or structures, but also how do we diversify revenue streams and not just rely on the foundation world for fundraising, which is like, you know, if anybody here has, a, you know, has worked for a nonprofit, you know, it can be a goddamn pain in the ass and soul sucking and just like a really difficult thing. So we're, we're starting to understand a little bit more about social enterprise tax credit programs, being able to partner with, um, you know, other organizations and institutions who are doing work outside of, let's just call it a, a art world adjacent but really doing it in a creative way that's leveraging the resources that we have available because we're a guest in the Revolution Recovery House. Um, Dimensional Lumber, for instance, we're waiting to hear back on a grant where we would be subsidizing the raised beds of a, uh, an urban farm in Southwest Philly. Being able to, um, you know, what their mission is in terms of teaching about food sovereignty, preservation of African diaspora through crop cultivation, and marrying that with the mission that we have as a, as a nonprofit, which is creatively visualizing and, and um, challenging perception of waste culture, and being able to do more of what it is outside of the scope of the residency program to kind of bolster the resources and opportunities available to artists who come through our program. So there's a lot more to talk about. I usually. Uh, Maybe we should just break and get into some some questions, Nato, if that makes sense. Sure, no problem. Hey, I get it. I get it. Just let me start, kick off. Thank you so much, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> the most action-packed artist talk of all time. I hope everyone appreciated that. And I really hope you don't expect that to happen at every artist talk because uh, you really raised the bar there, buddy. Um, hey. That was incredible. And, and, you know, the timing with that, that dump of that truck was awesome, too. It was really cool. <laughs> so... Um, you know, just a dumb question. How many artists do you have per year? What's their, how, like, how long is the residency, et cetera? Like, what's the pace of that? And, and if any that's of these great. artists at the school want to apply, or what's the process for that? I always kind of anticipate that's a general artist question. It's a great question. And just to let all your, uh, everybody on the call know, we have our open call open right now. And it's open until October 31st. And since 2018, when we received a really uh, amazing grant from the Andy Warhol Foundation, we now are able to award stipends uh, for artists who are, who are in residence. And we also reimburse for travel and housing for artists who are coming from outside the region. We only award five residencies a year, along with that you know, open call process. We have one fellowship every year. This year, we have the amazing Karen Olivier in residence developing work that should culminate sometime in the spring of 2023, spring or summer 2023. Um, so we always have that. It's a more like a year long residency where they can kind of rub elbows and cross paths with the open call residents. But um, yeah, we do, we, with the fellowship, six artists a year, we try to make it tailor fit. We don't want to assume there's a one size fits all approach to this type of work. And it really is just, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a tailor fit type situation. I just saw a question pop up in the uh, chat, but I can't, I couldn't read it. Disappear too quick. It's in the chat still. Um, it says it's from Megan. She asks, do you consider emerging artists as well as those with robust resumes? Absolutely. It's like it, it, it's open to all emerging and mid-career artists for those uh, more established artists. We we we, uh, we keep that out for the fellowship program. We want to make sure that we're making ourselves available to artists of all uh, levels of career. That's great. And what are you looking for in a candidate? Like what's the what do you what makes for a good resident? It really is about like uh, we encourage everybody to either take a tour like we just did uh, watch the YouTube tour that we have on our website to really understand the context in which they're applying to and the work that we do and how we do it as an organization, have a sensitivity to the relationship we have with the recycling facility and making a project proposal that makes sense and 
accurately can I, uh, you know, ex be exam exemplify how that work needs to happen here and why mm -hmm. it's not just like, if you can take care of a project by just going out on trash night, we're not going to take any interest in, in the work that you're proposing. But if it really dynamically is utilizing the tools and resources we have available, we're excited about it. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, Here's a question. Do you see the chat, Billy? Yeah, what's up, James Burns? I, I, I do, but since I'm on my phone, it pops up and then it goes out. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll read it. It says, hey, Billy, great to see you, man. Been too long. Very curious about the Superfund site and what are some of the ideas you have entertained recently? Ah, that's a great question. Um, one of them is like, is uh, we've been toying around with the idea. Oh, for for anybody who's interested in more of the history of that, on our on our website, there is this, uh, the projects page, there's this thing that we did called Site to be Seen. It was a Pew funded project where we had the legendary Merrill Latterman Euclid as our visioning artists and residents, along with other scholars, curators, and artists. Um, and they created responses to the site based on um, information that was compiled in the dossier, a research document that chronicles the history and a profile of that, that site um going back hundreds of years so beyond just programming and like iterative type uh gestures that we might be doing with artists who are in residence it's a really kind of tenuous relationship on what we can do but we're trying to figure out how to run a demonstration farm for at least 24 months in order to i was talking about those uh, dimensional lumber material sourcing and circular economy initiatives that we want to be able to build capacity with a demonstration farm is something that I think would be a great way to start building that broader network of partnerships and collaborations, um, whether it's just because of what we're doing with the materials and outfitting, making it possible by uh, making these kind of build out groups, or if it's just the, the idea that we're literally growing sustainable food systems on a toxically contaminated but contained Superfund site. So that's one there's a bike trail that's supposed to come through there within the next five to six years. That is a whole other topic of conversation, but it's, um, you know, just south of that is also a, a little estuary that we look forward to gaining access to the river via the Superfund site. So there's a lot of interesting future potential of working on the waterway in conjunction with the Superfund site. Um, and then, you know, I think just building out that uh, circular economy initiative in turn we want to be able to do more with what we have available and the art program as awesome as it is. And as excited as I am to, you know, bring new, new artists and creatives in every year, it's, it's really just scratching the surface in terms of what we have uh, available. And then not even for me as an artist, I really would love to develop ideas of my own that run parallel to the work being done of the organization and the artists who are coming through the program. So that's that's super fun in a nutshell. I love it. I mean, just to say, obviously, you know, a key thematic at the school, but it's just a thematic because it's relevant and people think, tend to think about relevant things is sustainability and concerns around the ways in which our infrastructures produce or destroy the world we're in and how to rethink that. I was going to ask anyone else got a question. You can also, hi, Cloudy. I didn't see you there. Hello. Hi, Alessandra. Um, I didn't know you and James. Hi, James. Um, anybody want to just jump in? You can just also just ask the question. You don't have to use the chat unless you just you know, want it. Or comment, thought. Just jump in. Jump in. Hey, Billy. Good to see you, man. Uh, I guess the question I have, the, the bike trail that's going through there, is that part of the circuit trail that's connecting uh, pretty much north-south along the the Carter there? Yeah, it's the Greenway. Um, yeah. And Riverfront North is kind of in control of all those parks and connector trails north of Allegheny, um, running up to the city limits. And it's a big, it's kind of a throwdown between waste management and parks and rec and Riverfront North and whether or not that actually is going to, they're going to get that right of way. So we're still, it's like a little bit of a battle, um, but it's in their master plan. We'll see what happens. Are you guys on board with it or is it? Uh... Oh, hell's yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing where I have to like 
be careful about balancing my emotions and, uh, you know, excitement either way and look at it as really, you know, an amazing opportunity if it does happen, but still keep my excitement and enthusiasm if it doesn't. So, and that's kind of both in, in both camps. It's really just, it's a, it's a prospect, um, but there's, it's, it, there's no definitive uh, ruling on it thus far. Okay. What about a timeline? Five to six, I think. Um, and the idea there is like, as we grow a capacity and we try to take on these initiatives within the circular economy um, and try to develop more pointed or intentional educational opportunities within that kind of cycling back and forth between art and circular economy, um, it, it's, it's, it looks as a strategic uh, uh, allyship between this organization that's doing all of this amazing work and educationally restoration, conservation, um, and creating civic amenity all the way up the uh, the, the the coast, the the, the waterway. Um, so, I, I can't, we can't bank on that, but it is it is exciting as a potential. Do you guys have any plan? I guess that this is kind of like leading into the question that I had. If you guys have plans in the event that it does go through, um, and how it would um, how it would live on the on the site and how it would be. I don't know. It seems like an opportunity for interactive some sort of interactive uh, pathway that might be a little bit different than what you get through the other paths. Absolutely. I mean, we, we're, we, we did a project with the Community Design Collaborative like two, three years ago, um, where we had renderings and cost estimates about how we create like a community hub as a destination on that trail. Um, as like, there's not really that much be between Lardner's and then going all the way down to Allegheny. So like, how are you making this a destination? And all your people in Harrisburg and in, in the state capital, they're going to want to hear how this is creating jobs, how this is, uh, you know, increasing community and economic development in the area. So all of those things were already, let's just say, reading into and developing ideas around that circular economy that uh, we have this, you know, we have ambitions and aspirations to drop shipping containers down there on concrete pads and creating studios and educational, um, you know, like temporary, uh, you know, outposts and, and hubs for activity. But in terms of being able to get ahead of that and program it, that, that's like too prescriptive for us at this point. And it's not something that we want to force feed, but understand um, more organically as opportunities arise. Kind of going back to the demonstration farm is like, that can start answering a lot of these bigger question marks in terms of what it is that we should be doing that's relevant to now, but still being able to retain this nimbleness and flexibility as a small nonprofit to be able to pivot when it's really important to be doing that. So Billy, it's, it, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in with the, Claudia had a question too. Do you collaborate with schools and other educational programs? And if so, how? Yeah, so we, one of our, I think most um, repeat, customer is University of Pennsylvania. We award a lot of residencies to uh, folks coming out of their master's program, but we've also done, you know, uh, kind of, let's just call them play residencies for graduate students there. We've done visiting artist programs with them. I've gone and talked about our program and other projects that we've done at the, at the, at, uh, at their MFA program. We do a lot of tours um, as an educational tool, the tour is really like one of the things that opens people's eyes to this whole other world that otherwise was invisible to them for a long time. That happens across all departments and all the different art schools in Philadelphia. And ever since the pandemic, because Zoom is an amazing tool, um, we're, we're able to do that much for much farther beyond the region. So um, in terms of the, other than I'd say we did a little bit of work with Drexel when we were doing the anthropologists and archaeologists, and we continue to work with the University of Connecticut and this archaeologist who, um, Dr. Gresh, who is, uh, he studies uh, cleanouts and stuff like that, and he brings his um, archaeological students to do a field study and field school at the Allentown or Delaware facility that we also facilitate for. So it's, it's, it's not a a one size fits all like educational initiative. But when we have the opportunity for, especially if there's funding, um, that makes it possible for us to go outside of the, the residency uh, program to, to collaborate or facilitate for these other schools or uh, departments and groups. 
That's great. Anybody else with a question or thought um, for the wonderful and pink Billy to follow? <laughs> Cloudy, go ahead, put your, you're muted. Oh, okay. Hi, hi, Billy. I was just thinking a lot about also primary and secondary schools because I think that must be such a huge impact on them to see how that whole construction, destruction side works. It must be so, you know, it must be really a strong image and how could you involve them? That's, that's why I asked that question. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing, the barrier of entry is safety and, and liability. That's really why we don't do people who are under 18. And we have in the past very limited group size. Uh, I'm very interested in how we make the messaging and the things we offer in terms of educating folks available to a younger audience. I was working with a um, an intern from Swarthmore College on piloting and developing ideas around refrigerant sequestration in a creative context as something that's being done as a necessary requirement to combat climate change. And one of the things that we started piloting before the time he was done up in terms of writing it out and understanding better is how we uh, can convene a youth climate um, panel where we're actually able to bring in Zoomers and folks who are much younger than me <laughs> to give us our, their feedback after giving them a certain amount of the history of the work that we do in revolution recovery in the context of the industry, but being able to hear directly back from them and their concerns. So it is, I hope to have the capacity to be doing more in, in that arena. Um, but like but historically we've been, we, those, we've those been small. piles of stuff are like hella dangerous. Kids just want to jump in that stuff. Like, but there's it's, nails and crap everywhere. Yeah, dude, it's not, it's dangerous. Yeah. And, and those trucks, those truck drivers are crazy. A lot of blind spots. Yeah. <laughs> Elias, do you think it's dangerous out there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Elias, it's yeah. dangerous out there. Elias has been here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, yeah. Kids like danger. Yeah, Anyone but when else? you can... When you can remove that barrier of entry and, and, and open this up for more creative discourse, I think that's when things get really interesting, right? I and how do you too. take that, how do you, how do you do that beyond just the tipping floor, in my opinion? And that's the thing that I'm interested in exploring more of the, more of the things that we have access to beyond just this facility. And that's like the future of what we're hoping with both on the Superfund site, but growing capacity to being able to take larger inquiry into account and, and develop work and projects moving forward. Well, Mark's had a fun question. He says, what's the culture in relation to rescuing any quote treasures uncovered between the drivers and the residents? That's a great Mark. question. It's shared. <laughs> Um, it's basically like I, I, you know, maybe at the beginning of the season, I was here after hours and the front end loader was pushing material and I found an envelope with like 600 bucks in it and I split it with them because if you don't do that, it's a faux pas um, in terms of when, you know, if there's money or let's just say money, that's the easiest way to do it. Because if you think about people who lived through the depression, who might be dying around now um, after their lives are dumped here. If they squirreled away hundred dollar bills in old shoe boxes and the people cleaning out that house can see it, that's on the tipping floor. And when that happens, everybody gets cut out. So it's like an unspoken rule. Um, and that's just using money as an example. How often does that happen? I mean, it's happening every day to uh, some degree, but it's usually when it comes to like lots of money, that's it's very far, far, few and far between. <laughs> Yeah. I do have a I do have a gold collection though, just to answer that. It's not what you're looking for, but you find it from time to time. <laughs> you have a lot, you have lots of collections, I would imagine. I have lots of collections. I have lots of collections. Yeah. Some official and some very uh informal. <laughs> hey, well, I listen, have a question. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead, go, it's Prio. Yeah. Uh, hi, Billy. It was really good to see uh, the presentation. It was really active, how he was running. You were running and here and there and showing the uh, space. But I want to know about your practice as duo that you are working with your brother. 
I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, I guess you work with many artisan or craftsmen, and you collaborate with other people to make those uh, works. I was going through your portfolio. So can you talk about your uh, practice with craftsmen and how do you collaborate with them? And what is the process of uh, those work? So in terms of craftsmanship, um, that's uh, me and my brother, are like we kind of have, we have an affection uh, for craft and those sculptures and installations are made by the two of us. We don't actually work with craftsmen. It's more about, um, reflecting the idea of the labor or the trades, the trade or the craftsmanship in that specific sector, like the conduit bending or the HVAC uh, construction. Um, so in terms of like a larger collaborative within the industry and their, the labor that that's still future projects and proposals to be worked out. It hasn't, I, I should also back up and say the work that I've been doing with my brother up until about 2015, we officially were like collaborating and showing for about, you know, our entire lives, but like in terms of uh, like showing our work and working on projects together for about seven or eight years when this opportunity to start the recycling center residency and start, you know, diving into that both creatively, but as this opportunity that you create for others, um, that, that kind of took front seat for a while, while my brother was actively getting deeper and deeper into set design and theater, what he was doing hit the, the the projects he was working on you know for for good they became very successful and he was traveling around the world for about you know four or five years on a variety of projects while i was with the team developing and building out the resources in, uh, at rare so we kind of took a hiatus and just had our first show in six years last last fall um and we did a residency at the drawing center that was really kind of the first opportunity for us to co both collaboratively work on site with film and video. Um, so it, it's not as much about this larger atelier that me and him have. It's more of a, um, uh, you know, we, we share principles, ethics, morals, and values and aesthetics and interests. So it's like, that's a brotherly relationship that um, we've had our entire lives. Um, and there's five boys in our family and me and him are the ones that work together. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like we have our individual interests and in the things that we do, but we always return to the, the, the duo and the collaborative and bring what we have as available tools from our individual approaches to how we, you know, either creating opportunity or collaborating with other groups and institutions and bringing that back to the collaborative is the thing that we, like, we really enjoy doing. Uh, would love to do it more, but it's, you know, again, it's... Um, <laughs> He's yeah. like, I, I want to make art. It's just running this thing is also a passion. Again, you got a lot of passions. Hey, listen, I want to say this. Thank you so much, Billy Defala. Everyone, give it up to the charismatic, amazing Billy Defala and the work that you do. It's really such an honor to talk to you. I also want to mention again, they have an open call for the residency. It's an incredible program. You are in good hands, just so long as you don't get run over jokes. Um, it's totally great. And Billy's got an incredibly visionary and also charming uh, environment that uh, that comes along with. So thanks so much, folks. Thanks, y'all. Have a great weekend. A good one. Artists around the world. Teaching artists around the world.